Parkway, how you guys doing? All right. Is anyone else doing good besides the front row? Well, I missed you guys last week. Uh, I do appreciate the thoughts and prayers while we were away uh, under difficult circumstances, but I am uh, just glad to be back, happy to be worshiping with you guys in person. Um, and also, I would like to say buenos dias and buongiorno. I worked really hard on that, and I don't know that it was fully appreciated, uh, or if you're going to connect the reference, but I think you're going to understand here in just a minute. So let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to begin our worship with a song of identity, identifying who we are in Christ. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free in I'm a child of God, yes, I
You guys can take a seat. Let's again go through the ordinance of baptism. You know, the Bible tells us when Jesus came up out of the water, that a voice from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God was pleased that Jesus was baptized. The scripture also tells us when, a, when someone gives their heart and their life to Jesus, there is a celebration going on in heaven, a party of the angels celebrating that another heart has been given and a life given to the Lord. And so today we are celebrating. We're not just watching. We're not just witnessing. We are celebrating today because we're coming to give an outward expression of what God has done in the hearts of these young ones today. Brooklyn Atkinson comes today confessing that she has already asked Jesus into her heart to be her Savior and her Lord, an outward expression of what God has already done. She is washed clean. She is brand new. The old Brooklyn is gone, and what's new is what God has in store for her moving forward, and we rejoice with that today. Brooklyn, is that your testimony, that you've asked Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord? Brooklyn, on your confession of faith in front of all these witnesses, it's my privilege to baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You're buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk a brand new life in Christ. This is Miss Lexi Dillard. She is here today because Jesus has spoke to her. She's chosen. She's chosen for forgiveness and for forever, and she said yes to Jesus. And she's met and talked with Miss Melody and others, and, and we're celebrating today what God has already done in her heart. Lexi, is that, your, is that your story today that you've asked Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord? Lexi, on, on your profession of faith in front of all these witnesses, it's my privilege to baptize you as my brand new sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You're buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in a brand new life in Christ. <laughs> Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we rejoice today that the baptismal waters are again stirred. We thank you that you are moving in hearts and you're moving in lives, and we say, do it again. Do it in my life. Do it in our life. We celebrate and worship you today because you continue to move and to heal and to transform each and every one of us. God, as we lift our voices in song, may, these, may this song not just be words on a screen or on a page or from an instrument. It's from our heart to your heart, celebrating the great God that you are. May this worship be pleasing in your sight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Continue to worship him. Sing His praise aloud. 
Lord God, we love to sing of your greatness. Sometimes it's really all that we need to sing about. As we just envision a time in heaven, as hard as it is to fathom, but a time that we will bow before the throne and we will sing praises to you endlessly forever and ever, declaring your greatness. We love you so much. The breath within our lungs and every praise we have to offer is yours. We love you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat. became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom for
It's great having everybody join us today in person or also online. Thank you for being with us today, worshiping in God's house. What a great day to be here together celebrating. We have worshiped him in multiple languages and in multiple styles, and we did baptism and we've sung our praise. It's just a great, great day to be here. I'm so glad to be back. We had a great time away with my family last week, and I appreciate so much those of you who you know, our staff are covering for me and for Tom who spoke last week, and uh, we are a great team around here. And so we work well together and we cover for each other and we just, we can all do multiple things. And so it's just great to have a, a great staff. Our youth are back. They were going to camp this past week, right? They had a great time at camp. And I hear rumor that Alan won some kind of award for the best youth minister at camp. Was that right? Good job, Alan. Excellent cheering section. I'd vote for him best youth minister in the world, but we don't have that award. Maybe we'll make one and put it in your office, Alan, or hang it over your door or something like that. But uh, glad to have our youth back and glad you guys had a great experience at camp. So as we begin to, to look, at, look into God's word, would you just bow with me for a word of prayer? Father God, we have talked to you today. We've sung about you and we've talked to you and we've prayed to you. And now it's time for us to be silent and to listen and for you to speak. It's time for us, God, to look into your word that was written long ago, but also written for us today, and to see what your word would have to say and would have to, to speak to us in our lives today, something that we're going through right now. And I pray, Lord, that as we read it, it would bring to our minds and the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts something that is going on in our lives today, and that we could leave this place with a new purpose, with a new vision, a changed person, a follower of Jesus Christ. Speak, Lord, because your servants are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember the last time we talked about the book of James, we were, James was writing his, his letter to believers from all over. They were scattered everywhere throughout the countryside. And James was concerned because, because they were scattered there was temptation all around them. They, were, they weren't together in a group. They were living in pockets, and they were, they were going to work, and they were living beside non-believers at work. And everywhere they went, they were, they were seeing things and hearing things about, worship this God. No, worship that God. Why don't you do this and bow down to this? Eat this food, and, and, but you shouldn't eat this food, and do this and do that. And James is concerned because the believers were beginning to fall away. And he, he wrote it in the first chapter of James. He said that, you know, be ready for the trials that you have. And we talked about last time that, that we should be ready for the trials. And he wants us to stand firm, be anchored in our faith. Don't be pulled away by the waves and the wind that whatever society tells you to believe and do. But stay anchored in your faith. And then today we're going to see that James said, not only will you face trials, but you will also face temptation. You see, that the believers, they were tempted to start doing what the other people did. They started being tempted to believe what the other people believed, even though they knew that's not what God wanted for them. Even though they, he, they knew that that's not what they're supposed to be about. They've been raised right. They've been taught right. They know the scriptures. They know what it means. And yet the ways of the world was beginning to pull them and draw them so much that James is saying that the ways of the world is creeping into their spiritual life, and yes, even into the church. And I would say not just then, but now as well. Because as you and I live our lives outside of these four walls, we come in contact with people who do not believe the way we believe. We read in the newspaper and on social media. We see it on every movie, every TV show. Our culture is blasting out things that we know that we don't believe and that the Bible says is not true, and yet... Because we are bombarded with it over and over again, we begin to be tempted and drawn away and pulled away from what we know is true, and we can find ourselves walking down a road of temptation. And so James wrote them, he said, be careful of temptation. And what he said then holds true today because it begins to get into the culture of our church. It begins to get into culture of my life and of your life. If we're not careful, we can be pulled away as well. And next thing you know, we're doing things and believing things and saying things that we never, ever imagined that we would do or believe or say. Don't you notice a couple of things about James, what he says to the believers then and now. The first thing he tells them about temptation is he says that temptation not, does not come from God, 
temptation comes from our heart. Don't blame God. You don't say, oh, well, God, God tripped me on that one. He tripped me up. I didn't, you know, that's not, God doesn't tempt us. He's not out there trying to make something bad happen so that he could, whoop, I put it out there and you weren't strong enough. That's not what he's doing. Because you see, for us to violate God's will, to break his law is sin. And sin separates you from God. And if you're separated from God, it will send you to hell for all eternity. So why would God want you to go there? He doesn't. And if that's not his will for you to go there, he wouldn't possibly try to trick you and make you stumble. Therefore, you break his rules. God's not the one doing that. We're going to see that James says that the temptation that we face, it comes from our heart. If you have your Bibles, look to James chapter 1. We're still in chapter 1, I know, but we'll get get further eventually. James chapter 1 and look at verse 13. It says this. It says, when you are tempted. Notice it said when, not if. When. It's going to happen. It's probably happening right now. Something that you're going through at work, in your relationship, in your marriage, online, on TV, in social media, is happening all the time. When you are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and nor does he tempt anyone. God doesn't do it. Now, God allows it. You would say, isn't that the same thing, Matt? No, it's not. He allows it to happen, but he's not the one tempted you. Satan is the tempter. You remember in the book of Job when When Satan comes to God and said, I want to tempt Job, and God allows the temptation. It wasn't God who's doing it. It is Satan who is the tempter, and that's important to remember. It's also important to remember that God tells us that we will never be tempted more than we can stand. You can never say, it was was too much for me to handle. I just couldn't. Yeah, you can't. He will always give you an out. He will always give you strength if you turn to him. So we can't blame anybody else. But the truth is, it's our heart. The truth is our heart is corrupt, and our heart is constantly looking to cheat. Our heart is always looking for something better. Our heart is always looking to pull away from God. You remember what Jesus said to his disciples? They fell asleep in the garden again and again, and he came back. You remember what he said? He said, I understand. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember him saying that? You want to stay true, but you can't stay true. You want to stay focused, but you can't. Jeremiah 17, 9 also says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. The heart is deceitful. Your heart is always wanting to leave God. Your heart is all, your spirit wants to stay true. Your soul wants to stay true. But the flesh in you is always looking for something better. You always have a wandering eye. You're always looking for something And there's a struggle going on within each of us. And and James is saying that there's a struggle of temptation and that's going to be coming your way. And then he says this, the second thing he tells us, he shows us a cycle of temptation that every one of us go through. You're going through it right now. I'm going through it right now. And Satan is unoriginal. He takes you through the same cycle. It doesn't matter what the temptation is. If he's tempting you with alcohol and drug addiction, he uses this cycle. If he is tempting you for something else, pornography on the computer, he goes through this cycle. If he is tempting you to have an eye for someone other than your spouse, he goes through this cycle. If you're at school and you see somebody cheating and you're tempted to cheat, you know what? He will take you through this same cycle. If the world is trying to tell you things that are not true and he's trying to lure you away, he will take you through this exact same cycle. So as we look at it today, I want you to recognize what it is and find where it is that you are being tempted and what stage you are in. That's your assignment as we walk through this. The first stage of the cycle of temptation is called the look. It's called the look. And I will use a fishing analogy, which Jason Fryer will love this, I'm sure. And he'll correct me if I do this wrong. There's some other fishermen in the room, too, who, who love the fish. But the very first thing that happens when you're fishing for that great fish, that, that trophy fish, is you're going to have this lure, and you're going to throw it out there in front of the fish so that he will look. You're not going to take the lure and throw it on the other side of the river, right? Apparently, that's what I do because I don't catch much. I'm throwing it in all the wrong places because we will fish and not catch a lot. Okay, we'll sit out there, and that's why they call it fishing and not catching. We will, but Satan, he's going to take that lure and he's going to drop it right in front of the fish, and watch what happens. That fish, all he does is just look. He hears the splash, and he just goes, "Oh, 
Look at there. It's just that moment when he takes his eyes off of where he was and he looks over here. Look at verse 14 of James chapter 1 and look at what happens with the look. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. He is dragged away. His attention was here, and all of a sudden there's, there's a, a distraction over here, and you look, and all of a sudden you're not looking where you're supposed to. You're looking somewhere else. It's just a look. But that's the first step to the cycle, is that you're dragged away so that you can be enticed. It's something that catches your attention so they can just for a moment to get you from looking here. You haven't moved yet. You haven't sinned yet. You just look. I mean, how's the look dangerous? What's the problem with looking, right? I just, I just glanced at the world. I just glanced at what they're doing. I just glanced at that picture on the computer. I don't know. I just looked over there. I didn't do anything. Well, here's the problem. It's the first step to the cycle. This past week, my family and I, we were in New York City. And we went all over New York City. We had a great time. We rode the subway. And I don't have any great subway stories for you to tell today. Maybe another time. But as we went all over New York, one time, one of the days we went to Times Square. And, you know, Times Square is massive. And the whole part of, the whole theme of Times Square is distraction. Because we're walking through Times Square, and there are billboards everywhere. And they're all flashing these advertisements. Buy this. Look at that. Look at this. Look at these new shoes. Look at this athlete. On and on. And it's just over sensory overload. It's overwhelming because your eyes are drawn to all these things. There are people there trying to get your attention. And there's kind of odd people there. Did you know that? There's some odd people in Times Square. There's somebody dressed up like Pikachu or something to get a, in a big stuffed animal to come, come get your picture made. And you can, you know, for like $5, you can get your picture made. There was somebody dressed up as a transformer. Bumblebee, if you know, if you know the difference. But like this huge transformer is there. And the kids could come up and get their picture made with a transformer. Distractions. Trying to get your attention to make a dollar. There was the naked cowboy was there. Anybody know who the naked cowboy is? We caught him right as he was leaving. He's, a, he's famous. He, he wears like tidy whitey underwear, and he has got a cowboy hat and some boots and a guitar. And he's just out there to get a picture made. He's famous. We saw him as he was leaving. I said, oh, look, there's the, oh, never mind, don't look. No, don't look. No, never mind. Just let him go. Good riddance, right? There was a lady there who was trying to be like the naked cowboy. She was about 85 years old, and she had a cowboy hat on, and she had boots and a white bikini, and I, we decided not to partake in that photo op. I mean, you know, we was like, I don't think so. But then, so we got all these distractions going on, and then these guys keep coming up to you and trying to sell you things. We're walking this way, and they're like, oh, you need a map, or do you need a map of New York? And I thought, well, that'd be a good idea. And the second I stopped to reach my hand out, they pulled it back, and now they're trying to sell me something the little bait and switch. And I was like, oh, you got me. I stopped. And he got me to, we we're going this way. And he got me to stop and to look. That's the problem. I look this way. I'm supposed to be going this way. I got distracted by the look. And that's where Satan starts your temptation process. He gets you from your eyes where they're supposed to be and something shiny flashes up and you immediately just look. And you go, oh, well, how about that? And your attention is dragged away so that you can be enticed. The second stage of the cycle of temptation, after the look comes the lure. If you are fishing, you will throw that lure out there, and man, those fishermen know how to make that thing dance. That lure starts to dance, and that fish goes, wow, look at that. That looks great. And you start, and that fish starts thinking about, wow, I wonder how great that is. And he wants a closer look. So what does he do? He looks, and then the lure starts dancing. And what does he do? He starts following. Like in a trance, you're pulling it in. And if you're a fisherman, you've seen it, right? You're pulling the lure. They're following the lure because that lure is dancing, and it is so inviting, and it looks so tempting, and that fish can't help but to follow because the lure is specially designed for that fish. Satan has a lure for each one of us. Did you know that? Satan is going to put that thing out, that temptation that's, that's your temptation. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're at work, 
and, th and things are tight at home and you're at work and you see some money in that petty cash and you think, what would it hurt if I just take a little bit of that cash? Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. It's just a little bit. I'll pay it back later. And that, that thought, that looking at the money, and then the lure of the money begins to pull you and entice you. Notice that you pull the fish away. You don't stay where you are. The temptation doesn't happen when you're around people. It happens when you're alone, in your car. If you're riding home with your boyfriend or girlfriend, that's when the temptation happens. Not when you're in your parents' living room. That's not tempting. Where was it that Jesus was tempted? In the Jerusalem temple? No. He was taken into the wilderness for days so that that temptation, that lure could be presented to him because there's a separation, there's a dragging away. Look back at verse 15 again. Look at verse 15. 14 said, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived... You look first with your eyes, and then your mind starts to think, and you start to desire with your mind and with your heart. You start thinking about it. You start wanting it. You start desiring it. You start thinking about how great that would be. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else seems to be happy. Their life seems to be great. I want to be like that. And the lure begins to pull you. Did you know there's a, there's a lure for every single fish that's out there? It doesn't matter what kind of fish it is. There's a lure made specifically for that. I have some lures right here. This is a, this is a frog, topwater lure. I have never caught anything on that. Um, here's one that has a little bitty you know, lip on it. So it'll go just a couple of feet underwater. I've never caught anything with that. Let's see. Um, this one is designed to go a little bit deeper. Have caught a snook on that. It was an accident. Kind of snagged him in the side. I think it was just by accident. I can't really take credit for that. But I like this. This one has a really nice wiggle to it. And then there's, you, know, you got the, the worms, and they're designed to sink to the bottom. Right? You got some that go on top, you got some that go in the middle, some that go on the bottom. But listen, when they, when they design these lures, they make it look exactly right to tempt that fish. They make it look perfect. They make it move perfect. They make it taste perfect. A perfect temptation for that fish. So if that fisherman who knows what he's doing, not me but others, if they know what they're doing and they use that bait... At just the right time, when the water temperature is just right, and the depth is just right, and the fish is hungry, and the sun is up in the sky just right, if all the conditions are just right, and they take that bait, and they drop it out there in front of that fish, and they make that lure start to move, you know what? That fish is probably going to go for it. It's almost impossible to resist. Did you know that Satan has a lure just for you? He has created a lure that is exactly the temptation that you have the hardest time to resist. He knows exactly what your temptation is, and he has a lure made exactly for you. And it looks just right, and it moves just right, and it talks so sweet, and it, look, and it tastes so good. And if, and if he will get the right condition when you are tired and worn out and frustrated when you just had a fight with your wife or your husband or you're at work and things aren't going well, and if he gets the right conditions at the right time and he drops that lure in front of you and it starts moving, it's going to be trouble for you. It's going to be almost impossible. He is fishing for you. And he wants to lure you away from what you know is right and what you know you should stand for and he's going to entice you away and he's going to drag you away with this lure that is specially made for you, not for anybody else. He knows, what's the, he knows the secrets of your heart and he will pull you away and when no one's looking, when it doesn't matter to anybody else, you think it's not going not to hurt me. And he's going to pull you away because he has a lure specially made for you. Specially made. You go from looking to thinking in your mind to desiring in your heart. You saw it. Now you're thinking about it. Now you're starting to do it. You're flirting right up with that temptation. I'm not going to do it, but I just like to look at it. 
and I like to, to get up close to it, and I may, I don't know, and you know, I may get on that website, and I may not click it, I don't know, but you get yourself right up to the edge. I want to see as close as I can get to this edge without falling off. And some of you think eventually, I'm just going to walk off the stage, right? You think, I'm going to get as close as I can to the edge without stepping over, and you're putting yourself in the cycle of temptation. And when you do that, you need to be careful, because Satan is fishing for you. The third stage of the cycle of temptation. We've had the look and the lure. Now it's the lip. It's the lip. This is when that fish comes up and he's following the bait and he bumps it a little bit. He doesn't take it yet. He just bumps it just to, just to see what it's like. That's when you start to nibble just a little bit on that temptation. You don't bite it. Just a little nibble just to see. And you look around and go, that wasn't so bad. Nothing happened. It's not the end of the world. I'll bite it again. And you take another bite. And then you go back again and you take a little bit of bite. And by that third bite or that fourth bite, the craving and desire comes up in your heart and you just go ahead and you just bite it. And you take it, the temptation. Verse 15, look at this. It gives birth to sin, going to the next one. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. It gives birth to sin. You've gone from looking, now you're doing. Now, now you're not just watching other people on the test. Now you're like, I think I'll, I think I'll cheat on this test. Okay, I think I'll look at this website. I think I will. I think I will talk to this person that I know is not my spouse, and I, I think I'll get kind of a little familiar with this. I think I'm going to take the drug. I think I'm going to get away from everybody, and I'm going to try the alcohol. I'm going to take my relationship that I know should be here, and I'm going to take it further than it should be because we're not married yet. And I'm going to do that because that's what the world says I should do, and that's what looks appealing to me. And what's it going to matter? And we take the bait. Because now it gives birth to sin. We went from thinking to doing, to tasting, and to touching with our hands. And now we are in trouble. Because the fourth stage is, after the lip comes the landing. You're caught. It's over. It's dinner time. You don't even know you're caught. You are hooked, and you are, don't even know you're hooked. Do you know that's possible? I was fishing one time, and we hooked the fish. We got it close to the pier, and another fish was following it, so we just let it sit right there. Let's just let it sit. It was swimming around. It didn't even know it was caught yet. It, was not in, it, was not any, it didn't feel like I'm not in danger. There's no, there's no stress. It wasn't fighting. It wasn't running away. It was just swimming around right there. Could have picked it up any time. It was hooked. But the other fish was following. And so Parker took his line and dropped it in, caught that one too, right beside him. And when we had them both caught, we just picked them up caught and didn't even know it. Caught in sin, stuck in sin, away from God, not looking where you're supposed to, looking over here, going over here, now you're biting it, now you're caught, now you are landed, and you don't even know it. Satan has you right where he wants you. You know that Satan knows that he cannot take you away from God. So all he would love to do more than anything else is discredit Christians demoralize Christians and drag us away so that we can't tell anybody else about, about Jesus. He doesn't want us to be a lighthouse to the world, to share anybody. He wants to pull us away so that our testimony no, no longer matters. You're landed, and you don't even know it. Look at the verse. The verse says it. It gives birth to sin, and when sin is full grown, it gives birth to what? To death. You're done for. Discredited off. No longer useful for God's purpose. But James says you don't have to stay that way. That we can stop the cycle. That we can stop doing what, what, the direction we're going. We can recognize it when we see it. And that's the third thing James says. He says to break the cycle. Where do you break the cycle? You break it at the look. When you see yourselves looking away, that's when you stop. That's when you realize, oh, I'm not supposed to look at that. I need to stop looking at those things. Guys, be careful what you look at. Listen to me, guys. You are affected more by what you see than what you hear, feel, touch, or taste. What you see, the eyes affect the guys more than anything else, more than girls. The eyes. Guys, be careful what you're looking at. Don't let your eyes wander to things that, that you're not supposed to be looking at, whether it's on the computer, on your phone, or on social media, or a live person. Be careful what you're looking at. But girls, help us out a little bit, okay? 
I've heard girls say, you know, guys never look me in the eyes. They look everywhere else, but they don't look me in the eyes. And I say, that's a problem. Because guys, we should be looking in the eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. And the smile is the window to their whole personality. That's where our attention should be. But ladies, let me talk to you for a second. We'll get back to the guys. Ladies, help us out. Please don't do anything that would distract our attention from your eyes and from your beautiful smile. That's probably too vague, so let me be very direct. Please do not wear things that are low cut here or high cut here or really tight like things like, like yoga pants or other things because that pulls our eyes off of your beautiful face and your beautiful smile and it puts our eyes somewhere else. And if you're getting people's eyes somewhere else, you are now putting guys into the cycle of temptation. You did that. You're putting them to look away from their spouse or whatever, whatever they're supposed to be looking at and you're taking their eyes off of that and looking at you. And you've become a stumbling block to their Christian walk. That's a dangerous place to be. You do not want to cause someone else to sin. You know what the Bible says about being a stumbling block? You remember what Jesus said? He said, it would be better for you to have a millstone around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea than for you to cause any one of these little ones to stumble. Stumbling block. Don't wear things to draw people's attention to anything other than your eyes and your smile. Guys, you're not off the hook. You are responsible for what you look like and what you look at. You are responsible for if you're looking this way, that you're not supposed to be looking over here. And I know sometimes things pop up, shiny things get your attention, and you look over. But when you look and you see something you're not supposed to be looking at, let me tell you guys, bounce your eyes. That's a great principle. Bounce your eyes. You look and you go, whoa, I'm not supposed to be. And you bounce right back where they're supposed to be. You bounce your eyes. You go, whoa, I'm not supposed to be looking at that. And it doesn't matter if it's in person. If you're watching a TV show, this happens at our house sometimes. We're watching something, and something comes on, and we're like, whoa, let's turn that channel. Bounce the eyes. We, maybe we go back to it when that scene's over with. That's up to you. But you can't sit there and just watch it because it matters because it puts you in that first level of the cycle of temptation, the look, which means you'll be dragged away and enticed. And after you're enticed, then you're going to be tempted to bite. And you don't want to start that process. You stop it at the look. Guys, bounce your eyes. That first look, you, maybe you can't help that. But that second look becomes sin. Because you start going, this is how it looks. You go, oh, oh, right there. That was sin right there. I just went, oh, and I should have bounced my eyes. But instead, I looked again, and I began to linger and when I start to linger, I get me drawn away. And when I'm drawn away, you see the process that can go. Satan is fishing for your soul. He is trying to take you down. Satan is a punk. Get mad about it. It's personal. He's trying to destroy your home. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy your kids. Get upset about it and say, I'm not going to be about any of that. James said one more thing, how to break the cycle. Verse 22, and this is the last thing I'll say before we close. 22, he says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Instead, do what it says. Did you catch that? Christian, act like a Christian. Christ follower, act like a Christ follower. Do what you're supposed to do. Look at what you're supposed to look at. Man up. I know it's hard, but there's no excuses. It's not too hard. God will help you. Take a stand for what's right. Tell the world, I'm not going to believe that stuff. I'm not going to do that stuff. I'm not going to be about that stuff. If you were a follower of Jesus and you went through the baptismal waters like Lexley and Brooklyn did and you proclaimed to be a follower of Jesus, then act like it. Look at the verse 23. Anyone who listens to this word who listens to the word but does not do what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror, and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Translation, you're in this room. We're here worshiping God. We're celebrating, we're singing, and we walk out the door, and we go do whatever we want to do and what everybody else tells us to do. We forget who we are. We forget who we belong to. 
It says, if you're a believer, act like it. Pretty strong words, right? James is saying it matters what you believe. Satan is fishing for your soul. He is fishing to destroy you and your family. You better put up your guard. You better not look. You better not follow. And you better pay attention to what God is saying. Temptation's all around you. And I remember what my parents used to say, maybe yours did too, as I was heading out to go out with friends somewhere. They would say, remember who you are and whose you are. That means you are a follower of Jesus. You belong to him. Can't live the way the rest of the world lives. Can't do whatever you want. It makes a difference. You can be the light that shines to the world. You can be the light that shines to everybody around you. You can make a difference in other people's life. Your faith can help other people follow Christ. Stand up. Man up. Stand for what's right. And remember who you are and whose you are. Would you pray with me, please? As we went through this cycle, I wonder if there was anything that came to your mind where God was revealing to you, yep, that's where I am, right there. I'm in the look or I'm in the lure. Man, God has almost got me. Satan has almost got me to the lip. I better be careful. What is the temptation that Satan is putting before you today? How is he trying to pull you away from whatever God has you to be? And are you ready to make a change? Are you ready to say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be about that. I want to be what God wants me to be and nothing more. Father God, I pray that in these moments that you are revealing and speaking. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us the things that we don't even notice. God, that we're right in the middle of the lure. We're being drawn away, and we didn't even notice that. But I pray that now you would bring it to our hearts and to our minds and that you would give us the courage to say, enough. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to walk a different direction. I'm not going to be about that. And we would stop the sin cycle in our lives. And God, I want to pray for somebody in this room today who would say, it's too late for me, Matt. I have already bit the, I already bit the hook. I already took the bite. I followed, and it, it pulled me away, and it's too late. I am stuck in a, in a cycle of sin. I am, I've got an addiction that nobody else knows about. I can't stop looking or tasting or taking that. And I would say to you, it's not too late. It is not too late to break the sin cycle in your life. You can't do it. You're not strong enough. But by the power of Almighty God and the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, you can be set free today. If you just confess it to him and say, God, I'm, I'm stuck in sin. My relationship's not where it needs to be. I've messed up. And let him reach down and restore you. And you can leave this place a brand new person. Changed from the inside out. Redeemed and set free forevermore. Father God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Speak to us if someone here needs them. Rededicate their life. That today would be the day. If they need to just to, to cry out to you, God, save me. For the first time, I pray, Lord, that they, today would be the day when they surrender their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Maybe they need to join this church. Father, I pray that you would, you would nudge them and say, now is the time someone else needs to be baptized to say I'm a believer but I need to go through the baptismal waters to follow Jesus' example. Today would be the day when they would do that as well. Father, this is your time to speak to your people. I pray, Lord, that we would hear and that we would respond. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During this time, you can make a commitment right where you are. But there are staff down front, and we would love to pray with you and rejoice with you with any decision that you would like to make. However, God's speaking to your heart. Don't walk out of here forgetting who you are. You respond to him today. Let's stand together, and as we sing, you move as God speaks to your heart. Good.
present to you guys an exciting decision. Come on up here. DJ Cuffman, come stand right here. Last week after the service, DJ went to his parents and said he wanted to be forgiven. He understood because he went through VBS and they talk about it their family a lot. And he understood what it means to give his heart to Jesus. So he's about a tender age as this. He comes today saying that he's asked Jesus into his heart to be a Savior and a Lord. He met with Melody this week and they prayed together as a family. And we've confirmed that he understands what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to give his heart to Jesus. And he comes today saying that he wants to follow Jesus and to be baptized. Well, look, there's water. What prevents someone from being baptized even today? Nothing prevents them from being baptized even today. So Bobby's going to do announcements for just a minute. Then we're going to end with a celebration of yet another. 
who's going to go through the baptismal waters. And even today, because there's no day like today to be a follower of Jesus. If you would receive DJ Cuffman into the Parkway family, would you give him that Parkway wave of welcome? DJ, we're so excited. I'll give a round of applause. And then... And in just a moment, when we actually do the baptism, it's going to be much more applause than that, I'm sure. Wink, wink. There's going to be a lot more celebrating than that because of the decision of this and others. We're excited about how God is moving in our church, how he is speaking to hearts and lives, and lives are being transformed. Listen to what he's saying. He's speaking to you and about your life. Listen and respond today. So I'm going to ask the Cuffman's to come on over here, and DJ, we're going to go over here. I'm going to turn it over to Bobby, and as we get ready for baptism, come on, DJ. Do celebrate, DJ. You don't have to worry. The tension's not all on you. We are celebrating Jesus Christ and His wonderful work. Very, very exciting. Um, also exciting to have a couple of mission teams back. Our youth, some up here, some here. Uh, Alan, exciting to have our Benton mission team back as well. You'll be hearing more from all of those along the way, I'm sure. Isn't it great to think about what God has done through the youth and their work, through the Benton team and their sharing of Christ over in that area? Very, very exciting. I want to say something again that I said earlier. God's Word, man, it encourages us and really lifts us up sometimes, doesn't it? It also really cuts and convicts when he needs it to as well. I'm thankful to him. I'm also thankful to Pastor Matt, to Brother Matt, for preaching the Word of God when it's exciting and uplifting and when it's really challenging and difficult as well. Quick announcements. No game night tonight, but it's on August the 1st. Also, last Wednesday, I wish everybody could have been with us. Wonderful prayer time led by our Minister of Music Search Committee. And we weren't just praying for them. We're praying for the process. We're praying for us. And it was really, really good. They reminded us every day, based off Matthew 7, 7, what's that say? Somebody can, I, you can all quote it. Ask, seek, knock, right? So we're reminded at 7.07 a.m. or p.m. or both to be praying every day. And I hope you'll also turn it into thanksgiving and praise because the Lord is going to lead. He will show who he wants to bring to this staff team, to this church, as we continue to reach out and reach people for Christ. Finally, Go Night this Wednesday. You have a chance to go with us in a variety of forms. Um, Second Harvest, there's some yard work that needs to be done, and there is some... Demolition, no dynamite, demolition and cleanup to be done. And then there'll be prayer here on site for those who either can't physically go to do those others or just say, I need to be here and be a part of the prayer team that night because there are only limited spots. We hope you'll sign up on the way out. Let's get on to the really, really, really important stuff. Brother Matt. You know, when God's Spirit begins to move, it's often the young and the tender-hearted who respond first. Some of us are jaded with hearted hearts, but DJ is not like that. He has felt God moving, God speaking to his heart and calling him to be a follower of Jesus. We've heard his testimony, but so everyone else here knows. DJ, is that that what you're saying today? Are you, if you ask Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord? DJ, on your confession of faith in front of all these witnesses, it's my privilege and honor to baptize you as my brother in Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You're buried in the likeness of his death. You're raised to walk in brand new life in Christ. stand and sing one more time. Um, we're just going to sing this bridge from Follow You Anywhere. And it can be a little bit scary to say these words out loud and mean them in our heart, to say that, God, wherever you lead, whatever it costs, God, I'll follow you anywhere, because that's an unknown place. And when we're honest, the unknown is scary. The beautiful thing is we might not know exactly where we're going, but we do know who we're following. He's trustworthy, and he is faithful. 
and we can put our trust and our hope in him. And we can say with all of our hearts, all right, God, because I know you and I know how good you are, I'll follow you anywhere. So if you feel comfortable this morning, I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand in submissive obedience to God and sing these words out wherever he leads and whatever it costs, we'll follow him anywhere. So wherever you lead me, and whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you. And wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want to worship with you guys this morning. I pray that you'll carry that spirit with you out this morning. That you'll take a spirit of obedience. And say, all right, Father God, I'll follow you anywhere. I hope you have an amazing week, and I'll see you next Sunday.